So what have been some of the highlights from the past uh, past talks? It seems like a really good lineup you've had. Yeah, we had, uh, you know, I think the um, winter quarter started real strong. We had Paul's talk, which was amazing. And then um, mm -hmm. Apple's talk last week. Um, that was also great. And, you know, we're, we're in line. I think, you know, we'll have a third grade talk today. That's right. Uh, that's right. Um, and then um, in the fall, it was also like um, quite diverse, quite engaging. We started with uh, Al. Um, mm -hmm. We had uh, uh, Matt Jackson talking about some uh, some of his uh, recent work. Uh, John Kleinberg talking about something that's completely different, but it was like yeah. uh, refreshing. One of our colleagues, John Burge, uh, um, mm -hmm. actually presented his work related to electricity markets. So it was like um, that's great. It was so uh, amazing talk. So it's a little bit of a so econ, computer science, operations research. So yeah, yeah. exactly. And that, that was great. like to have some interdisciplinary. Yeah. yeah. No, I, I was not saying that we are covering all kinds of markets, right? So <laughs> from electricity to trading markets to mm -hmm. ma matching markets without money, everything, all kinds of markets. A lot of markets. Yeah. <laughs> Good. That's that, that, that's wonderful. All right, good. Okay, um, so it's about time. time. Uh, maybe let's get started. Um, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to today's uh, AMD seminar. It is uh, my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Eric Budish. Um, Eric is the Stephen G. Rothmeyer Professor of Economics at the University of Chicago, Booth School of Business, a research associate at the uh, National Bureau of Economic Research, and co-director of the Initiative on Global Markets at Chicago Booth. His main research, uh, his main area of research is market design, with specific topics studied, including financial markets, matching markets, ticket markets, cryptocurrencies, and incentives for um, innovation. Budish received his uh, PhD in business economics from Harvard University, his MPhil in economics from uh, Oxford, Nutfield College, and his uh, BA in economics and uh, philosophy from Amherst College. Uh, Budish's honors include the Marshall Scholarship, the Sloan Research Fellowship, uh, the AQR, AQR Insight Award, the Arrow Award, the Leo uh, Melamed Award, and uh, giving the 2017 AEA AFA Joint Luncheon Address. Eric, uh, thanks for uh, being with us uh, today. Uh, we are looking forward to your talk. Um, 
but before Eric starts, I have a very brief announcement for the audience. Um, we will try something uh, different this week. If you have any questions, please just uh, raise your hand and uh, we are going to uh, allow you, you know, we are going to uh, make you a panelist and you can directly ask your questions to uh, Eric. Um, Eric, with that, the uh, floor is yours. Thanks for joining us today. Oh, well, thank you so much for having me. Let me, uh, let me go ahead and share, um, uh, share my screen. Great, can you, uh, you can see me okay? Terrific, so this is, um, I'm, I'm really cl glad to be, be with you. This is uh, a, a, it, it, one of the wonderful silver linings of, of, the, of the, the mess we've been in for the last nine months has been the opportunity for events like these, especially this conference where it brings together researchers in an interdisciplinary fashion, these kinds of gatherings are you know, hard, hard to pull off in real life, but in, in Zoom life, we can do it. I'm really glad to be with you. Um, so this is work that's joint with uh, Matteo Aquilina and Peter O'Neill, both of whom are of the UK Financial uh, Conduct Authority. And it's a, a simple new approach to quantifying the uh, high frequency trading uh, arms race. So financial markets have changed dramatically over the past few decades. Uh, as recently as the late 1990s and e even the early 2000s, depending on the asset class, human beings played a, a, a significant role in intermediating a large fraction of financial market volume, whether traders on specialists on trading floors or in trading pits here in Chicago and so forth. Uh, and, and, and now, of, of, as you all likely know, financial markets across a wide array of financial instruments are almost entirely uh, electronic. So equities, which will be the focus of, of today's uh, paper, but also futures markets, treasury, you know, the US treasury market is largely electronic, uh, foreign exchange, uh, options, options have been a lot in the news a lot this week. Um, this electronification on the whole has brought uh, clear measurable benefits to the performance of our financial market uh, plumbing. So measures like the cost of liquidity or the cost of, you know, cost of trading large blocks of stock. And then some of the key sites are, are listed here. But this lot of electronification has also been associated with a lot of controversy, particularly around the role of speed and high frequency trading uh, in modern markets. And that's where this, this, my research in this paper comes in. Uh, so at the center of the controversy over speed is a phenomenon called latency arbitrage, also called sniping or, or picking off. Um, in plain English, a latency arbitrage opportunity is an arbitrage that is, describe it as mechanical, obvious. If, if, your grand, if you showed your grandmother the stock charts, she could kind of see what the arbitrage was. Uh, but capturing, it, the, capturing the arbitrage, being first to capture it is, is not obvious. It's a, it's a contest in speed. So the example in, in some of my previous research was arbitrages between the um, S&P 500 futures contract and S&P 500 ETF. So kind of the same asset, um, but at high enough frequency, there'll be temporary mispricings uh, that can be exploited by whoever is, whoever is fastest. The same stock on multiple venues. So this week, there's probably a lot of latency arbitrage oppor opportunities in GameStop or AMC. Um, a treasuries market arbitrage against futures versus cash instruments, currency triangles, and so forth. Um, in conceptual terms, I've defined latency arbitrage as rents from public information signals that at least in principle are meant to be symmetrically observable by all market participants and as distinct from asymmetrically observed private information signals that are at the heart of the classic models of market microstructure, like the Kyle model or the uh, Gloston, uh, Gloston Milgram uh, model. And at the top of this, at this, the top of this slide, by the way, I have a quote from Michael Lewis who said that the market is rigged quite famously on, on 60 Minutes and then a, a response from a high frequency trading lobbyist organization called the Modern Markets Ar Initiative that says latency arbitrage is a, is a myth, concerns are overblown. Um, so you likely have the intuition that arbitrage rents from symmetric public information 
doesn't make a lot of sense. That to, to make money, you're supposed to happen to know something the rest of the market doesn't know. And the, the, the key theoretical insight of my paper with Crampton and Shem is published in 2015, is that latency arbitrage is, if you will, built into the current design of modern electronic markets, a market design called the continuous limit order book. Um, and the issue is that continuous limit order book markets, number one, treat time as continuous, an infinitely divisible variable. And number two, process requests to trade uh, serially as opposed to in batch. Um, and this combination of continuous time serial processing uh, creates latency arbitrage. And the intuition is, let's say the market's here, bids and asks for the same, for, for GameStop stock. Um, and there's a, a, an innovation on another exchange where God himself says, actually the value should be up here. Um, in a continuous time serial process market, there's a race to pick off the stale quote rather than a, an, a costless adjustment to reflect the new public symmetric uh, information and even if even if Ozan and I and seven other uh, sophisticated traders see God's announcement at exactly the same time and process it with at exactly the same speed, someone's going to be first to to respond if time is measured continuously and and messages are processed serially. These rents from latency arbitrage we show in the last paper they're they're like a tax on liquidity provision. It makes it harder to make a market. Markets haven't exactly been stellarly liquid this week, right? Reddit was able to push GameStop stock from $2 billion market cap to $20 billion market cap. But latency arbitrage is like a, a tax on liquidity. If, you're, if you stand ready to make a market and there's new public information, you can get picked off. Uh, and also these rents lead to a never ending race for trading speed, where if I'm even a tiny bit faster than the next guy, I can get the free money. Um, we showed in the last paper how to fix the market design. That was a theoretical insight which was to move to a discrete time batch process market design. We called it frequent batch auctions. And what this does is it preserves the useful functions of modern algorithmic trading. And as I alluded on the first slide, there's a lot of evidence that computers are good I and mean, computers are good at stuff. Um, information technology has had benefits across wide specter of the economy. Um, but it preserves the useful functions of algorithmic trading while eliminating latency arbitrage and therefore enhancing liquidity and stopping a socially wasteful arms race for speed. All right, measuring latency arbitrage has been a hard thing to do. It's been elusive. Uh, my past paper provided an estimate for one specific trade based on S&P 500 arbitrage opportunities. My collaborators in this paper, uh, Matteo Aquilina and Peter O'Neill, along with some of their colleagues, at the UK Regulatory Authority studied uh, stale reference prices in UK dark pools, so arbitrage between the you know, on exchange trading and, and dark pool trading. But those are, those are measurements of a very specific trade the researcher knows, knows where to look for. There have been a couple of studies that have looked at um, trades and quotes data, so the, the kinds of data that is familiar to many financial economists um, and look for moments in the data according to the data's timestamps where the same asset has different prices across different exchanges. But the challenge with that, that approach is, first of all, it's hard to know which, of, which discrepancies are actually physically exploitable given noise and timestamps and speed of light issues. And this, the second challenge is actually just a subset of the issue. It's only looking for the same stock across exchanges so it's, a sub, it's a, an overestimate, if you will, of a subset. Uh, and the Hendershot paper is quite careful about describing the strengths and weaknesses uh, of this, this type of approach. Uh, and in the absence of comprehensive data, it's hard to know, you know, I think it's clear that we're right as a theoretical matter, but it's hard to have a sense of the overall importance of, of, of the issue. Is the market rigged or is, you know, myth is an overstatement, but are concerns overblown? And it's hard to do cost benefit analysis on market design reforms like, uh, like frequent batch auctions. So what we're gonna do in this paper is we use a, um, a very simple new kind of data to shed light on high frequency trading generally and latency arbitrage specifically. And this is data called uh, message data. So, so limit order book data, um, which is the traditional um, kind of data used widely across financial economics 
uh, provides the complete play-by-play uh, -play play of the limit order book. So all, all new offers to buy, all new offers to sell, cancellations of offers to buy, cancellations of offers to sell, trades and so forth. Often the timestamps are great, you know, down to the millionth of a second. Some studies have firm IDs. But what's missing in limit order book data are messages that don't actually make it into the limit order book data sequence because they fail. They get bounced back with what an effect is like a, an error message. Um, so if Ozon and I are racing, there's a new piece of information. We've raced to snipe this stale quote. I hope you can see, you know, see my hands. And I'm first, I get the stale quote, I snipe it. And Ozon is second to snipe or he's trying to cancel, but he's too late. He's gonna get bounced back with an error message that says, sorry, you're too late for that trade or sorry, you're too late to cancel your quote. And his attempt to act that was too late, he'll know he tried, but, but it won't leave any scent in the limit order book data set. Um, so you don't see attempts to snipe that are too late or attempts to cancel that are too late. And our simple insight is if you have the messages, not the limit order book data, you can directly see that there are multiple firms trying to engage in the same trade at the same time. They're, they're a direct empirical signature of speed sensitive uh, trading. Uh, races have winners and losers, but limit order book data, the, the data set that you know, New, York, New York Stock Exchange trades in quotes, like the, the, the data sets widely, widely used across uh, financial economics research just, just doesn't, doesn't let you see the losers if there's a race. So we got message data from the London Stock Exchange using regulatory muscle. The United States hasn't done any studies with using this kind of data. Kudos to the Financial Conduct Authority for using, uh, using some muscle to get, uh, to get the appropriate data from the London Stock Exchange. And what we got was uh, nine weeks of message data from a period fall 2015, uh, timestamps accurate to the millionth of a second, uh, the timestamps are at the right location in the exchange's architecture. It's kind of a nice to have, not a must have, but I'll, I'll show you what I mean by that in a few moments. Uh, and we have participant IDs too. So I don't know which firm is which, but we can track that it's the same firm over time. Uh, and that's, that's helpful for some of our analyses. And this data lets us directly measure a lot of what we care about. So we can measure how often are there races, their quantity. We can measure how long they take. We can measure how many participants there are in races. We can measure the diversity and concentration of winners and losers. We can measure uh, the economic stakes. You know, what, what is each race worth? What are the overall stakes? Um, and so let me give you on this slide a preview of our, of our main results. So first we find that races are, are pretty frequent. The, at the, in the FTSE 100, which is sort of like the S&P 500 in the United States, there's about one race per minute per symbol. So over 500 races per stock per day. Um, the modal race takes between five and 10 millionths of a second. Uh, so races are fast. Um, this was astonishing to us. So a full 22% of all trading volume takes place in races in, in contested opportunities to trade um, at, the, you know, at, the, at the high, high frequency level, you know, millionths of a second. Uh, race participation is quite concentrated. So the top six firms in our data win and lose over 80% of all races. Um, this is kind of a microstructure point. The fastest firms in this top six disproportionately in a race are the ones taking, uh, taking the stale, uh, stale quotes as opposed to the ones being, being traded against. Uh, so the modal, modal trade is a fast firm taking from a, a slower market participant. Um, races are small per race. The average race is only worth half a tick and a few bucks. Uh, but because it's 22% of all trading volume, it, it adds up. So let me give you a couple different quantifications. One is a microstructure measure. It adds up to about a third of all of uh, what's called price impact or the, or the bid ask spread. Um, so a third of all of, a third of, of objects micro, that are really important in market microstructure are caused by or associated with latency arbitrage races as opposed to trading from uh, asymmetric private information. Uh, and then second, if you add up the sums at stake, so you take all of the races and just add up what is it worth to win, it adds up to an amount of, um, add of amount of money where, first of all, it'll be about a half a basis point of volume. And I'll give you a sense in which that's big and small. Um, 
And if you could eliminate the latency arbitrage cost from the market, it would reduce the cost of liquidity um, by uh, 17, uh, 17%. So you could reduce investors' cost of trading by 17% by fixing, fixing the market design issue. Uh, and then if you extrapolate from our study to global equities markets, uh, just to give you a context for what a half a basis point means, it's about $5 billion a year in uh, global equities markets. That's not counting futures, currencies, uh, options, you know, all of the other kinds of asset classes that trade using continuous uh, limit order books. And, and I think as you'll see also in our study that our measurements are conservative in several important ways. It kind of gives you a sense of the, of the magnitudes and my kind of overall take on, on whether the magnitudes from our study are big or small is it genuinely depends on your vantage point. It's billions of dollars really important to a small number of market participants, uh, but is it a reason for you and me not to have our money in index funds and, and you know, invest for retirement? Like it's kind of irrelevant for long-term long -term investors. Another implication of our study is how we think about market design reforms like frequent batch auctions, how we think about the market's cost of liquidity. This, I think this study firmly places sniping from public information alongside traditional uh, informed trading from private information. Uh, our thinking about efficient markets theory, I think should be affected by, by the amount of trading volume that is races to respond to public information. So the idea that it's hard to predict stocks in the short run, stock prices in the short run, that's just false. There's a lot of, lot of predictability in the ultra short run. Um, and then fifth, the value of message data. So I, I hope that this study will be a first and other researchers will uh, we'll turn to using uh, message data for, for, for studies that relate to modern speed sensitive trading issues. Um, let me pause and just see if there are any, uh, just from, see if from Ozan, if there are any questions from the crowd and then I'll, I'll keep going and get into the heart of the, heart of the study. Um, there's one question uh, from Peter Crampton. In, in markets with large price tick and time priority, there is also a race to the uh, front of the book are you able to examine the importance of races to the front of the book? That's a, so Peter is a, you know, a treasured, uh, treasured colleague. Peter, it's great to have you here. Um, so, so the short answer is we don't in this study, let me kind of, let me clarify, let me trans restate the question just so everybody's on the same page. Um, if you have a market with a, um, a large price increment, um, so, so U.S. stocks trade in penny increments. So for stocks with, with uh, nominal share prices that are in the hundreds of dollars, the penny isn't super binding. But for you lower, lower nominal share price stocks, the penny is quite binding. And in other financial instruments, tick, tick, inch, tick sizes can be quite binding. That creates a race to be the firm that's making the market and collecting the bid-ask spread if, if there's con constraints on the price competition. Uh, we do not try to measure uh, the stakes in that race. Um, that's another component of the speed race. And the, the UK market is, is less tick size, the UK equities market has less of the tick size constraints than, than parts of the United States stock market. So I would love for someone to use message data to study precisely Peter's question, but it's neither the purpose of our study nor the right context to study it in but it's a, a great, uh, really great question. Um, all right, so let me give, um, let me go through a schematic for how um, the London Stock Exchange's um, ser servers work. Uh, and then this will help describe the nature, uh, the nature of, our, of our data. Okay, so, so here's an inbound message. It's coming from a trader marked T1, this is Ozon, or is Akshaya sending a, a limit order to buy, you know, to buy at ten dollars? Um, that message makes its way ultimately to uh, what's called the matching engine. The matching engine is kind of the logic of the stock exchange that you know, keeps track of all of the, you know, all of the limit orders in the book and you know, executes trades. It find, finds matches. Uh, along the way, it passes through gateways and a sequencer. These kind of technologically just take take load off of the matching engine. There's details in the paper, but aren't super important to emphasize at this moment. The matching engine does some stuff like figures out, can 
the order post to the book? Can the order trade? Should the order get told, sorry, you're too late? And then messages get sent back to the trader via distribution server. So the trader will ultimately hear like, okay, your order posted to the book or, oh, you just traded or sorry, you're, you're too late to trade. And we're, we're capturing our data right here, just at, outside the exchange's um, uh, you know, outer wall, if you will. Um, so we get all inbound and outbound message traffic just outside of the exchange's um, uh, uh, ser uh, server architecture. And this is a, a good place for measuring races because if, if T1 and T2 are racing to trade, this is sort of like the finish line in the race. This is who, whose message makes it to the exchange uh, first. But this is not a, a must have for studies of message data, but it's an, a nice feature of our data. Uh, combinations of inbound messages and outbound messages together tell you what happened in the market. So I'll give you a couple examples from this table. So for example, if I send a new order to buy at $10 and that order posts to the book, the inbound message will be a new limit order and the outbound message will say, yeah, that order posted to the book. If that same order is sent to the market and trades against resting liquidity, the outbound message will tell you that it traded against rested, resting liquidity. If the inbound order at the bottom row was marked uh, immediate or cancel saying, if I can trade at 10, great, but if not, don't put my order in the book. Then if it's not able to trade, it'll get bounced back with an error message called order expires. This is an example of the kind of trading activity we see that wouldn't be in traditional limit order book data. And similarly, if I try to cancel a stale quote and I'm too late, I'll get sent back an error message. So combinations of inbound messages and outbound messages allow us to recreate the play-by-play -play of the market with this additional color on the messages that, that failed to, uh, to execute. Okay, so the, the theory from my last paper with uh, Crampton and Shem, uh, hello Crampton, uh, it's nice to, nice to have you here, um, suggests that the empirical signature of a uh, latency arbitrage race is as distinct from traditional uh, informed trading on asymmetric private information in the Glaston Milgram style is the following four features. So first, there's a race, there's multiple market participants trying to act on the same symbol price and side. Um, second, it could be either a, um, a mix of aggressive orders to take and cancellations of resting liquidity. This is the equilibrium we emphasized in Buddhist Crampton and Shem. It could also be all takes if the liquidity provider, if the, if the resting quote in the book uh, is slow. And this is a, we show in an appendix of, of the current paper that this is also an equilibrium of the, of the BCS model. Uh, in a race, there are winners and losers. So some succeed and some fail. Uh, and fourth, all at the quote same time. So of, of these four items, the first three are relatively uh, straightforward for us to implement. And you know, the paper describes a baseline approach and then some sensitivity analyses around, around each item. The fourth one is really kind of conceptually the hard one because in a theory model, there of course can be such a thing as you know, simultaneous moves versus sequential moves. So the theory models can have a notion of what it means to act at the same time. But it, in, in data, no two things happen exactly at the same time if you measure time Finally enough, and our, our data is measured down to the millionth of a second. So even a, even a race among really sophisticated uh, firms will typically not manifest with, with timestamps that are exactly the same down to the millionth of a second. Okay, so we, we define at the same time uh, two, uh, two, import, uh, two ways. So our main method is, um, something we call the uh, information horizon. So the information horizon, let me kind of explain it in words rather than go through the, the formula on this, on this slide. It, the idea is if I send a message to trade and Ozon sends a message to trade, we wanna make sure that Ozon, by the time he sends his message in, couldn't have seen the outcome of my message. So our messages are close enough together in time that the second one couldn't be responding to the first one. They're therefore responding or conceptually responding to the same 
same information set, at least for that, for that symbol. When we compute this, we, we can see the, ma the matching engine's actual latency, like how long does the round trip take? We can also see in our data, what's the, the minimum observed re reaction time. So we can kind of measure this, this concept of, of when can we be sure that the second message isn't responding to the first message. And it's, it's ballpark about 200 millionths of a second. It varies over time depending on uh, the system latency. Um, the second approach we take is just to use sensitivity analysis. We consider a range all the way down to 50 millionths of a second uh, and all the way up to three thousandths of a second, three milliseconds. You know, this is blinking your eye takes about 400 milliseconds. So you know, 50 microseconds is uh, you know, orders of magnitudes faster than the blink of an eye. Um, all right, so let me now get into results. So the, the way the table, the way the paper presents results and is this is this is data data no one's ever had before um, or analyzed before? So we 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 try to just present kind of present hands of hands on the table, just like present the data. So we present um, means and just a wide variety of uh, of uh, a lot of distributional information uh, for all of the quantities that are economically interesting in our study. Um, in today's talk, I'll, I'll mostly emphasize the means, but you can kind of read the paper to get, get full distributions of stuff. So this is races per symbol per day. As I mentioned, the average symbol in the FTSE 100 index, this is like our US S&P 500 large cap index, has 537 races per symbol per day, or about, about one per minute. Smaller cap stocks have one per like eight minutes. Um, this is the duration of races. So this is... Um, the difference in time, if you see two races in a, two, two messages in a race, one of which succeeds and one of which fails, we measure what's the difference in timestamp between the first success and the first fail. Um, the mode, as I mentioned, is between zero and 15 millionths of a second. Each of these, it's a histogram. Each bin in the histogram is five millionths of a second. Uh, there's a fair amount of mass from zero up until about 50 and then a bit of a tail there's actually a little bit of mass to the left of zero. And this is not this is not an error. What this is is two messages that reach the exchange outer wall, where message one reaches there before message two, but they get processed by different gateways, by different you know, computer chips, and message two ends up making it to the matching engine before message one. It's sort of like picking the wrong queue at a supermarket. I don't think this is economically scandalous in some way, but it speaks to just how fast uh, races are that 4% you know, of the time, the quote, wrong guy wins the race. This okay. is data on the percentage of uh, trading trades and trading volume in races. Um, so 22% of all FTSE 100 trading volume takes place in races. As I mentioned, this is just, this is kind of astonishing to us. 21% uh, of all trades take place uh, in races. Uh, the typical race has, this is data on the number of participants and messages in a race. Um, the typical race has about three participants in the 500 millionths of a second from when the race starts to, you know, fr from starting from when the race starts. And because the information horizon varies depending on the matching engine latency, it's a kind of, this is kind of an easier way to portray this data. Um, of this three and a quarter participants, they tend to, on average, send three aggressive messages, so three messages to take, um, and 0.4 messages to cancel. This is a surprise to us. So, what we in in the data, um, most of the race sensitive trading activity is aggressive as opposed to cancels, which is indicative of uh, a lot of the quotes that are being that are the subject of races are. Uh, are controlled by firms that are, are not at the cutting edge of speed. I'll give you some additional evidence uh, consistent with this in a, in a few, few slides. Uh, but ab about three and a quarter participants per race, you see there's a tail where some races have a huge, huge number of participants. And most of the trading activity is aggressive, uh, about half a cancel per race. Uh, this is data on the winners and losers in races. So this is ranked by firm. Again, I do not know the identity of these firms. Uh, but we can link them over time. The top three firms, um, the blue represents how many, how, what percentage of races they win. The red re represents what percentage of races they lose. 
the top three firms win and lose together over 50% of all races. The top six win and lose together uh, over 80% of all races. And then, you know, then there's something of a tail. Um, so there's a, a decent amount of concentration in, in race behavior, at least in the UK equity market. Um, and within these top six firms, there's actually a pretty interesting and clear dichotomy. So the top six firms overall uh, win about 80% of races, take about 80% of all liquidity in races. When there's a cancel in races, they're, they're responsible for about 80% of that. Uh, but they're only about 40% of all of the, the liquidity that actually gets taken in races. The liquidity taken in races is disproportionately not the fastest firms. Uh, so the, the firms not in the top six are just the complement of the firms in the top six. Within the firms in the top six, there's two distinct sets. There's a set of firms, two out of the top six, that uh, both provide a lot of liquidity and take a lot of liquidity. They do most of the successful canceling in races. They win a lot of races. They provide a lot of liquidity in races. They take a lot of liquidity in races. And then there's a set of four out of the top six firms that disproportionately are engaged in aggressive trading or sniping. Um, so they win a lot of races. They do a lot of the taking, but they do very little proportionally of liquidity provision in races. So these are these are firms that, in a, in a sense, are are lurking, waiting for uh, steel quotes to snipe, at least in, in this data. Um, um, Eric? Yes. Um, uh, there are a couple of quick questions, I think. Yeah, um, go ahead. Um, so I have one question actually. Um, uh, earlier, um, I think you showed this figure with blue bars and red bars. Can you go back to there? Um, mm -hmm. A couple slides back. Yep. Yes. Yes. This one. So um, I understand the the uh, blue bars, the shares of races uh, won, mm -hmm. shares of races lost. It says first fail. Um, can Can you repeat what I should make of uh, these red bars? Like oh uh, sure. So the this is what I'm doing is for every race. I'm I'm sorry. I'm going through some of the results pretty quickly just to in the interest of, of covering the breadth of them. Each race we identify the first winner. Well, the winner and then the first fail message. Um, so the first, uh, so a, a typical race will have a single winner um, and then one or more losers. Um, in principle, there could be two winners if the first winner is, for example, a cancel of a steel quote, and the second winner is a taker of the remaining steel quotes. If there's multiple quotes in the book, uh -huh. there could be um, multiple multiple winners, some of whom are taking, some of whom are canceling. But what we're, we're doing is we're saying, who's the first success, the first winner of the race? And then the, to, to give a definition of loss that adds up to 100%, we're looking at the first message that fails. So either a failed cancel or a failed take. So these are just definitions of one and lost so that the, they each sum to 100%. Okay. Um, but then, and then the blue is how, what percentage of races did you win? So firm one won about 20, 21, 22% of races. And then the red is what percentage of races were you the first fail? And that's about 17%. And, and there, are, there, could be a, there could be many fails in a race, typically one success and many fails, but, but sometimes multiple successes for the reason I mentioned. And is, uh, what's the denominator here? Is it you know all the... Um... Percentage of races. So out of the... Out of the 537 races per stock per day, uh -huh. which, which if you just multiply by the number of you know, 100 stocks, so 53,000 races in the, per day in the FTSE 100, just out, out of a, we have a universe, if you will, six weeks out of, of races okay. that creates a data set of all races. And the, the denominator is out of all races, what percentage did they win? So I may participate in some of these races and not others. All of them are included in the, in the denominator. In, the, in this, yeah, in this figure, it's just equal weighted percentage of races. That's right. Not dollars, Perfect. percentage of races. That's right. And uh, there's one other question by uh, Alejandro. Uh, Alejandro, you can unmute yourself and ask uh, the question. Um, oh, yes, thank you. Um, so I, I just wanted to, to ask you uh, if you could tell us sort of uh, how surprising this is. So sort of like before you, I mean, given that it's very like new data and like a very sort of a uh, uh, sort of a new study, it, it's sort of like, a, sh should I think this is something that everyone sort of knew that things look like this, but no one had actually data for this, and now we have evidence, or we actually didn't have any idea of the, uh, the amount and the quantity of races and the frequency, like how surprised were you when you, when you looked at this data? 
You know, it's a, that's a hard question. Um, so, I mean, we had theory from my past paper with Peter and John um, on the, just the, theoretically there should be latency arbitrage just given the way the market's designed. And we have all sorts of they're indirect forms of evidence about latency arbitrage and some direct forms of evidence, including from our own past study. So I think like the, my prior wasn't zero and it wasn't infinity, it was somewhere, but, uh, but like pinning down sort of specific magnitudes in a specific market, um, I see is where the one source of the value we added. Um, and then we get, I mean, and, 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 and as you saw the modern markets initiative said, actually, you know, it's the whole issue is a myth. So being able to point to concrete empirical evidence that is not um, a theory model's implication. You know, we, we like game theory, but, you know, game theory doesn't, you know, isn't enough in a court, right? It's good to have, good to have data too. Um, so I'm not, not, I'm not saying this is in a legal dispute, right? but you get the idea. Um, so yeah, I, I think, you know, of the main findings, I tried to flag one that was particularly astonishing to me relative to my priors, which was the percentage of all trading volume in races, the 22% of all trading volume. I would say the overall magnitudes that it's in the billions of dollars, but not the hundreds of billions of dollars was more or less consistent, more or less consistent with priors and other forms of evidence. The Michael Lewis book cited a figure of $20 billion a year in global equities, but you know, most of the other indirect forms of evidence seemed a little bit lower than that. Um, the, the idea that most races were for relatively small amounts of money, that was consistent with priors. So, so a lot of the facts were consistent with, but, but my priors aren't scientific evidence. It's, uh, but I'm happy to come back to this at the, uh, at the, end, of the, at the end of the talk. That's a, it's a really, it's a good and hard question. Um, okay, so this is data on, um, by race, the combination of who is the winner and who is the, um, oh, so I should let me, let me state it slightly differently. Of, of all of the volume that trades in a race, who took the volume and who provided the volume? And the modal, the modal trade in a latency arbitrage race is a top six aggressive firm taking from a taking a quote that is not does not belong to a top six firms. So that's about 34% of all uh, of all trading volumes. This is like fast taking from slow, if you will. Um, the second most common instance is a fat a, an aggressive top six firm taking from one of the other one of the liquidity providers in the top six. And this is the kind of HFT on HFT combat that's most consistent with the equilibrium uh, Crampton Shim and I emphasized in our in our last paper, whereas as this is sort of more consistent with an equilibrium in which slow firm slow market participants have a lot of resting uh, limit orders in the book, uh, and and both are equilibria of the BCS model. Uh, okay, so now let me give you some data on profits. So the the mean race, uh, I think this is a mean over all of the races in our race data set. To Ozan's question from earlier. Mean race is worth about a half a tick, a little bit under two British pounds, a couple of basis points, uh, not huge. You see some variance where by the 90th percentile, things get a, a decent chunk bigger by the 99th percentile, quite a bit bigger. But even at the 99th percentile, a race is worth 40 pounds, not worth a you know, not, not million dollars um, per race. Uh, so it's, it's really the quantity that causes this to add up. Um, race profits, uh, this is from a millisecond up to 100 seconds. Race profits tend to get into prices some chunk of time after the race. A lot of race profits materialize by about 10 milliseconds after the race has occurred with the bulk by a, a second or 10 seconds. It's a bit faster for larger cap stocks, a bit slower for smaller cap stocks. Um, these are distributions of race profits and a, a microstructure variable called race price impact. Um, this actually is another thing that was surprising to me given my priors, just to the, la to the last question. A decent chunk of races ex post turn out to have negative realized profits. And reflecting on this data some more, I think what's going on is that some races are like the S&P 500 futures ETF trade, uh, where they're kind of mechanically obvious, very free money. 
But then some chunk of races seems like it's more multiple high frequency trading firms racing on a similar signal that sometimes turns out to be, you know, not profitable. Um, in, a, in, in the book about Renaissance trading, that's a great, a great book, The Man Who Solved the Market about a mathematician, James Simons, they describe if you have a trading strategy that's 5149, you can make a lot of money. In our data, it's much more than 5149, but much less than 100 zero. So there's a, a mix of some races that are based on 100 zero kinds of signals and some races that are, are more statistical in, in nature. Um, profits per symbol. I find this kind of hard to, the dollar amounts per symbol hard to interpret in isolation, but about a thousand pounds per symbol per day. Um, the, an easier way to interpret this is to normalize by trading volume. And this is the 0 0.4, 0 0.5 or so basis points that I mentioned at the, at the outset. So a basis point is one one hundredth of a percent. So it's about half of one of those. If you take all latency arbitrage profits divided by all trading volume. So as a fraction of trading volume, it sounds kind of small, but there's a lot of trading volume in financial markets, so it, it adds up. Um, and we give two different measures of this ratio. The bottom one is in some sense theoretically more accurate to use where you take latency arbitrage profits and divide by all trading volume that does not take place uh, in races. That turns out to be the more relevant version of this statistic to use for some of our computations about the harm to liquidity, but they're, they're pretty similar, about, about half a basis point. Okay, uh, latency arbitrage profits are highly correlated with volume and volatility. So like this week's been a great time, great week to be a high frequency trader. March, 2020 was a great time to be a high frequency trader. Uh, volatility and volume are, are, are good for business. Um, so we're, we're gonna translate our results on the magnitude of latency arbitrage into a harm to market liquidity uh, in two ways. Let me just check the time. Okay, we, have, we should probably wrap in about five, seven minutes. Is that right? Yeah, so let me go, let me go kind of quickly through, through these results and then I'll make sure we have time at the end for questions. So the first way is um, a traditional uh, bid-ask spread decomposition where you take the cost of trading called the effective spread and decompose it into a revenue for liquidity providers and then a term called price impact. We enhance this bid-ask spread decomposition to include uh, price impact from races and price impact outside of races. Um, I'll skip the, skip the math, but it's in the paper. What we find is out of a, a, a spread that's about three basis points, um, a third of all of, the, of that spread comes from price impact uh, in races and the, with the remaining coming from price impact outside of races. The realized spread is quite negative if you're the liquidity provider who gets taken in a race and otherwise kind of positive. So if you, if you make a market and trade not in a race, you make money, you make some you know, small amount of revenue but getting taken in races is, uh, is loss making. Uh, interestingly, one of the salient differences between the very fast firms and everybody else, they both lose money if they provide liquidity in a race. They both make money if they provide liquidity in non-race trading. The salient difference is that the fastest firms are much better at getting out of the way. Uh, which makes sense. I mean, the, the slower firms uh, are, are, it's very rare that they'll cancel and try to get out of the way. Um, the second quantification is we, um, this, this takes a, a, a chunk of math that in the end is kind of simple, but it was ex ante non-obvious, where you can express what would be the reduction in the bid-ask spread from going from continuous limit order book to frequent batch auctions. You can compute that you can take some, do some theory, create an empirical measure that and it's this formula, but you can go to the paper for the details, where the measure is you take latency arbitrage profits in the numer numerator and the effective spread paid and non-race trading uh, as the denominator. And roughly speaking, I, I mentioned the latency arbitrage tax is about a half a basis point and the spread is about three basis points. That half a basis point over three basis points is, is where the 17% uh, comes from. And in, in here's just a little bit more detail on this, but 16.73% you know, uh, in, our, in our full sample is the, the counterfactual reduction in the market's cost of liquidity 
if the market adopted frequent batch auctions. Uh, we then, the last thing we do in the paper is take this data and try to extrapolate from the UK market in sample to the UK market out of sample and then also to just global equity markets. Um, and we were, we're using the fact that latency arbitrage profits is very highly correlated to both volume and volatility to build simple extrapolation models. So this is basically the 0.42 basis points. And this is the same idea, but adjusting for the market's volatility in a particular day. Um, and using these extrapolation models in UK equity markets, it's about 60 million pounds uh, per year. Uh, over a range of uh, sensitivity analyses, it ranges from 20 million pounds up to 100 million pounds. Uh, in global equity markets, it's about $5 billion per year. And in our sensitivities from you know, about 1.7 to about 8.4. Um, and as Peter mentioned, we're not trying to include race to top of the book. Um, the, the method of identifying races is relatively conservative in that if I, if I take and you see that I've taken and then don't bother, we're not gonna pick that up. So I, I, on the whole, I think our exercise is, is pretty conservative, but this gives you a, gives you a sense, of, uh, sense of the magnitudes at stake. Okay, so let me, um, let me spend five minutes with a couple of discussion points and, and conclusion and then, then take some questions. So first, whether the magnitudes in this study seem big or small, I think depends on your vantage point. So from the per transaction perspective, the, I think the costs are like undeniably small, half a tick, a half a basis point tax on trading. It doesn't, this does not ring a five alarm fire. Uh, but on the other hand, the overall sums are quite large. Right, a 17% reduction in the cost of trading. That's a meaningful number for, for institutional investors. And then $5 billion per year, probably conservatively in just stocks, so not even counting futures, currencies, treasury, just options, just all the other asset classes that trade in continuous limit order books. It's easy using a discounted, you know, using the Gordon growth models, you know, D over R minus G, you know, profits over you know, discount rate minus growth rate, it's easy to get to a net present value in excess of $100 billion. So for like Peter, John, and I figuring out we should go from continuous serial to discrete batch to be worth $100 billion, and it's not, not bad as academic research goes, I think. Um, and overall, this is consistent with aspects of both the myth story and the rig story, or it falsifies aspects of both. It is genuinely small enough that ordinary households, you, know, you could be outraged by it, but you shouldn't worry about it for the context of your own retirement. Um, but it's billions of dollars per year for a relatively small number of parties. So uh, high frequency trading firms and then exchanges who sell speed to them. That's a subject of my work with uh, Robin Lee and John Shem, um, who then have a lot of incentive to preserve, uh, preserve the status quo. Um, let me kind of summarize the intellectual contribution. So there's the method using message data to measure latency arbitrage. I hope others will use this method. The facts that I've emphasized on the frequency, volume, speed, concentration, profits, and overall magnitudes of latency arbitrage. And then a couple of useful theory contributions on how to turn empirical measures of latency arbitrage into a fraction of the market's overall cost of liquidity. Um, some hopes for future research. So one is to better understand the sources of races. This study is agnostic. We just look for multiple firms trying to do the same thing at the same time. But we're agnostic as to whether it's caused by the same stock in another venue, a correlated asset within the same market, a correlated asset from another market, genuine news, and so forth. Um, Second is I hope there'll be more studies using message data. I think the United States Securities and Exchange Commission should get some and study it. Um, US equities would be particularly important, not just because it's our home turf, but, but in the size and importance of the US stock market, ETFs are a major part of the US stock market, unlike in the U, not as, they're not very large in the UK. And ETFs are redundant assets, right? So there's a lot of latency arbitrage opportunities. And also the US stock market's incredibly fragmented. There's 13 plus different exchanges, tons of dark pools. So the opportunities for latency arbitrage are likely to be larger still in the US than in the UK, which is another reason why I think our, our overall magnitudes might be a bit conservative. Uh, more asset classes. 
Um, the, the hard part is getting the data. You can have our code. Our code is going to be publicly available um, and as part of publishing the paper. And feel free to just reach out now if you if you have a, a lead on message data. Um, and then some some discussion topics. So magnitudes, big or small, we've talked about. Market design reforms. I've alluded to. I hope this will. You know, we should. Someone should try frequent batch auctions. Uh, this study, I think, puts sniping and latency arbitrage on firm empirical ground alongside traditional adverse selection. It should change a little bit how we think about efficient markets theory. And then there's a lot of other studies, topics you could study using message data. So it'd be great to study the events of the past week. It'd be great to study uh, flash crashes. You know, message data, I hope, will become a new standard, but exchanges have to make it available and regulators have to ask for it. All right, let me, uh, let me stop there. Thank you. Thank you so much for a super interesting talk, Eric. Uh, we already have a couple of questions. Maybe we can go to uh, Peter Crampton first, and then uh, Tang Yuan Liang uh, can ask his question. Yes, very quickly, because you just uh, pretty much answered it. Um, so the message level data with precise and accurate timestamps would be incredibly powerful in the study of market behavior and operation. And I'm just wondering, is there any chance that regulators could make such data available to researchers um, or at least to themselves? Uh, because, you know, essentially you, the regular can't even know whether the market rules have been followed without studying the message level data. Yeah, it's a, it's a hard question. I think the CFTC looked at some message data in their study of the flash crash. But I, you know the, the honest answer is like yeah we should be, it should be more available um, re, it should be available to regulators it should be available to researchers whether purchasing or under some kind of uh, license I, but but for this to be the first study ever using this kind of data strikes me that you know it's, it's a good paper I'm proud of it but like it, we should there should be more studies using this kind of data. Yeah, absolutely. And just in terms of the norms, you know, there's other sectors such as electricity where we have full transparency of the market data after a period of delay. Um, and so, you know, there's, there needs to be reform in finance. Was there, was there um, another? Yeah, uh, thank you. And you can unmute yourself. Um and ask the question. Hello, uh, can you hear me? Yep. Yes. Okay. Uh, just a clarification question. Um, how to define a race period when there are multiple players, for example, more than two players, that their inbound and outbound time are nested or chained? I think you went through an example when there are two players, as long mm -hmm. as they're... Yeah, so I went through this quite quickly. So th thanks, for the, thanks for the clarifying question. So the way the method works, is, and this is covered in exquisite detail in the paper, is we, we look, think of it as like we're looking sequentially through all of the messages for a particular stock on a particular day on a particular side of the book. We're looking for in, an instance where, we're looking for instances in, in sequence where there's two or more messages that, together constitute, uh, satisfy those race criteria. So again, the race criteria are two plus participants, uh, some succeed, some fail, uh, all at the quote same time. And then if they're you know, a mix of takes and cancels or all takes, those four criteria. Um, and then if, if we see a message at time T0 and a message at time T1 that constitute a race, well, then also look for messages at T2, T3, you know, anywhere in that window of what constitutes the same time. And we'll think of that whole set of messages as constituting the race, uh, all measured based on the inbound. Um, so inbound messages reveal like when did the participant get their message to the market? And then outbound messages help us figure out what actually, who won, what happened. Um, but I hope that answers it. So yeah, there could be races with three participants. We're careful not to, if there's message one, two, and three, we're careful not to call M1 and M2 a race and then M2 and M3 a race. That's, that's kind of a simple blocking and tackling issue where if, if there's a race, you then wait a chunk of time before looking for the next one. So it's all very clear in the paper, but I went through it quickly in the, in the talk, just in the interest of speed. Um, yes, yes, thank you. Thank you. 
Perfect. Um, I have one other question, uh, Eric. Um, actually, first a clarification question and um, then the other question. The clarification question is, um, if an order involves, you know, mul trading multiple units of um, uh, the stock or the mm -hmm. asset, um, how do you account for that? Like the, the first success and the fail times that you defined, uh, how, do you, how do you handle the, you know, partial fails? Um, so, yeah, good question. So, so most, you know, in financial markets, most orders are for multiple units because, you know, one, and in the UK market, most nominal share prices are actually quite small. Um, so what the key, the key in the method is that we're looking for both a success, one or more successes and one or more fails. So let's say there's a thousand shares resting in the book. You know, the market's bid 10, ask 12, there's a thousand Quanti of quantity offered at 12 and there's a race to take at 12. A typical race, someone would take all a thousand and then someone else would try to take, but it's not there or someone would try to cancel and it's not there. Um, if someone tried to take a hundred and then the next guy tried to take a hundred, we wouldn't count that as a race because you'd see two guys who traded, but no one failed. Everybody kind of got to do what they wanted to do. Um, if the first guy canceled a hundred the second guy took the remaining 900 and the third guy tried to take and failed, that would be a race in which you have two successes, a successful cancel, a successful take, and then a failed take. But the, the combination of we're looking for two or more, but we require that somebody fails, that's really what the requirement that there's a failure is kind of what gives the method some grip. Because to fail, there has to be nothing left. Or it could be a coincidence where your particular quote got taken, and we can, that's we can show that that's pretty rare. That's you, typically a failure is there's nothing left. Got it. And um, onto the question. So um, when when you were presenting the results, I was thinking that there might be some effects that uh, would suggest that actually the um, the uh, impact of the uh, high frequency trading on the market might be uh, larger. Um, and two things come to mind. One of them is related to something that you mentioned um, in the previous slide, um, correlated assets. So it might be the case that the price of one of them moves and I might be you know, trying to snipe the um, uh, you know, other correlated assets mm -hmm. benefit from the price movement that hasn't yet been taking place. I don't know if you are taking uh, um, this into account here. It doesn't uh, seem to be the case. The second thing is, and I don't know to what extent this applies to UK, but um, if you have fragmented uh, market uh, marketplaces, arguably you can look at one market and trade in the other one. Uh, any thoughts on how to incorporate some of these to the model? Yeah, no, all, all great questions. So I think conceptually, let me distinguish two, a few different things. So one is we might have conceptual priors for why different markets other than the London Stock Exchange within the UK equity market would tend to have disproportionately more or less latency arbitrage activity. And as I mentioned, my, my hunch is that the US stock market would have more, but I don't have data for that hunch. It's just kind of a, a informed observer hunch. And that would be because of the level of fragmentation, um, because of the role of ETFs. Those would be the two, two main, main, main drivers of that hunch. Another issue is what Peter alluded to much earlier in the talk is returns to high frequency trading that we're not capturing or not, not trying to capture. One would be the race to the, the top of the book. So the race to provide liquidity. If the market's bid 10, ask 12, and ticks up to bid 11, ask 13, the race to be the guy who's first in the queue at bid 11. Um, and if, the, if tick sizes are quite constrained, that, that race can lead to you know, a lot of rent also, which we're, not, we're, not just, we're just not trying to measure. That's not part of our study. Um, again, important in some kinds of asset classes, like futures markets with fat ticks, U.S. stock stock market with low nominal share price, not so much the U.K. market. Um, another thing that we're not trying to capture that I think is a, appropriate for us to not try to capture is just other returns to sophisticated algorithmic trading. And in particular, there, there was the phrase front running that came up a lot in the Michael Lewis book, which is essentially statistical pattern recognition. So figuring out like, oh, there's a lot of there's a lot of crumbs that suggest someone's trying to buy a large block of stock XYZ. Let me buy in advance of that and then sell to them later, which if XYZ is your customer is illegal, if you're just good at data science and can figure out a statistical pattern, that's profitable. That's, that's just predictive modeling. 
and a lot of our, you know, we got a lot of engineering talent going into predictive modeling in the financial sector. Probably a lot of deadweight loss there, but separate from the latency arbitrage issue. It's just a different, uh, just a, di a different, uh, a, a different potential source of deadweight loss. Maybe there's a market efficiency gain to getting prices discovered, to getting price discovery to be a little bit more accurate at high frequency, but just a, sep a separate issue from sniping. Thank you. Yeah, um, thank you. Don't know if there are any uh, final questions. I know we are a little bit over time, but if there's a quick question, maybe you can ask it to Eric. Otherwise, uh, we'll end the session. Did anyone make any money on GameStop or lose any money on GameStop? Uh, no, nobody is raising their hands, so I'm not sure. Raising their hands? <laughs> any Bitcoin traders? There's all sorts of fun stuff to trade these days. Uh, well, doesn't look like right. that. Um, all right, I'm happy to stay on for a few more minutes if there's any more questions, but th thank you very much for, um, for hosting. I really appreciate it. It's, it's great to be with you all. Thanks yeah, so thank much for so joining. This was a great talk. Thank you. Thanks.